Well, good morning, church. It's a good day to be in the house of the Lord, amen? Well, I am enjoying some time off this weekend, and so utilizing technology to be able to bring this message to you in my absence. Today we're launching a new series of messages that we are calling Without Love, Love Without. Well, I don't know if we have any Hallmark Channel movie fans in the house, but I have to admit that I got hooked on the Hallmark Christmas movies many years ago, uh, even before it was cool to be hooked on the Hallmark Christmas movies. Over the years, the movies have gained popularity, and now it's almost like there are seasons of Hallmark Channel movies. Uh, Christmas movies begin like on November 1st, and they run through New Year's Day. And just when I'm feeling like it's my peak opportunity to settle in for a good Christmas movie, then bam, suddenly it's January and the Valentine's Day movies begin. So for me, this just seems to be the appropriate season to talk about love. And maybe even the season uh, to be more proactive in our love. So today and over the next few weeks, we're going to talk a little bit about love and how we can put love into action in various ways. So I want to kick off this series of messages by taking a look at 1 Corinthians chapter 13, and I want to unpack a little what Paul is saying to the Corinthians here in his letter, and then I want to bring those principles home as we look at applying these truths in our lives. So 1 Corinthians chapter 13 scripture says this, if I speak in the tongues of men or of angels but do not have love, I'm only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have faith that can move mountains but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor or give over my body to hardship that I may boast but do not have love, I gain nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. But where there are prophecies, they will cease. Where there are tongues, they will be stilled. Where there is knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part. But when the completeness comes, what is in part disappears. When I was a child, I talked like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I put the ways of childhood behind me. For now I see only a reflection as in a mirror. Then I shall see face to face. Now I know in part. Then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. And now these three remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. So this passage is probably familiar to you. And for many of us, when we hear 1 Corinthians 13, our minds leap to weddings. Now, we've all been to a wedding where this passage has been read or preached. This is the Bible's go-to text on love. But let me give you some context here. You see, when Paul's letter was read to the, the congregation in Corinth, not a single person was imagining two young lovers pledging their devotion to each other. Paul didn't write these classic words on love while pondering a couple's intimate feelings for one another. No, he was writing to the church, to the followers of Christ who were engaged in this nasty conflict that threatened to tear their congregation apart. Now, when we lift this message out of Paul's letter and let it stand alone, it certainly provides true wisdom for couples standing on the threshold of marriage as well as for couples who've been married for 40 years. Paul's words are a blueprint for a strong foundation on which marriage can be built. However, if we read the 12 chapters preceding this one, we may gain an even greater appreciation of how important these words are to interpersonal relationships. You see, Paul begins his letter to the Corinthians, as he does uh, all of his letters, with a salutation. However, as soon as he completes his typical words of greeting and thanksgiving, he brushes aside formality and he really gets down to business. See, word has come to him that members are quarreling with one another and dividing into factions. And so he pleads with them to overcome their competing differences and to strive for unity. And throughout his letter, Paul tries to uh, approach uh, in different ways. He tries to force them to look closely at how they're dealing with each other. 
and to realize that, that the need that exists to alter their behavior before they end up just devouring each other. In the letter, we see Paul rebuke them for tolerating sexual immorality or for acting as if freedom in Christ means that anything goes. Now, he's upset with them because when someone in the congregation had a dispute with another member, rather than trying to resolve it within the church, they run to the pagan courts to sue each other. He warns them, too, to steer clear of idolatry and not to discriminate on the basis of income. In the chapter preceding the chapter on love, though, Paul talks about spiritual gifts. He says that God gives wisdom, uh, God gives some the, the gift of prophecy, that God gives to others the gift of faith, to others he gives the gift of speaking in tongues. And Paul says, those who possess these gifts are not to boast about their particular gift as if it is more important than the other gifts. You see, a church that has people with all these various gifts becomes a powerful force when, com when they complement one another, when they work together, when they do good for the whole. But this is not what's happening in the Corinthian congregation. People are elbowing one another. They're trying to, to gain higher ground as they boast in their particular spiritual gift as if it is more important than others. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, Paul is finally addressing their quarreling over spiritual gifts as it, and he's addressing all of those things that are dividing them into factions. And he says, if I speak with the tongues of men or of angels, but I do not have love, I'm only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy, if I can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, if I have the faith that can move mountains, but I do not have love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor, or if I give my body over to hardship, then I may boast, but I do not have love. I gain nothing. And at this point, uh, I imagine you could hear the, the, the air seeping out of the puffed up egos of those who had been boasting about their spiritual gifts. Because Paul basically says, if they do not possess a heart and a soul of love, well, they might as well just toss their spiritual gift into the gutter because without love, the gift is useless. Paul, he then goes on to describe the essence of what love is and what love is not. He says, love is patient and kind. It's wonderful to be with someone who is thoughtful and positive and generous. Such people are easy to love. But loving someone who is loud and overbearing and rude, it requires a great deal of patience and kindness. And what Paul told the Corinthians that love is patient and kind, we hope that they recognized how they had been anything but patient with each other. And kind? Well, they hadn't been kind. In fact, they were cruel to one another. Well, after highlighting patience and kindness, Paul lists the things that love is not. He says it does not envy, it does not boast, it's not proud. It doesn't dishonor others, it is not self-seeking, it's not easily angered, it keeps no record of wrongs. In other words, Paul says that love is the opposite of the very things in which they had been doing and feeling toward one another. So now, when we talk about love in our day, when you ask someone to describe love, most people's minds will tend to think of couples, and they will, they'll talk about romantic feelings or of sentimentality. But Paul, he doesn't mention any of those things here. Instead, he talks about love in terms of truly caring about the well-being of another. And he recognizes those things that prevent people from loving. Things like being overly focused on yourself, being envious of someone else's good fortune, imagining yourself uh, to be better than others or failing to show respect. And then in his letter, Paul starts writing about the strength of love. And I can just hear the preacher in Paul here, and I wish I could hear him speak it and offer an amen as he's preaching it. But this is what he says. He says, love does not delight in evil, but it rejoices with the truth. That it always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. Where there are prophecies, they're going to cease. Where there are tongues, they will be stilled. But where there is knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part. But when completeness comes, what is in part disappears. Paul's like, listen. 
All of those spiritual gifts that you are boasting about, they will eventually come to an end. But love, love will never end. Love bears, love believes, love hopes, it endures. Love hangs tough when storms blow in. Love withstands adversity. Love never ever stops believing that a breakthrough will come and a better day is possible. That's love. And everything that you do should be seasoned by that kind of love. Because remember, he's talking to the church, right? And he's like, this is the place where that kind of love should abound, and that's not what's happening. You've become colored by the ways of the world, and somehow, somewhere, you got this idea that there is to be competition in the church, and you have set yourselves to boasting. But there's no love in that. There's only flesh in that. And we've been set free from those trappings of the flesh because Jesus died for that. He paid for that. We are called to be different. We are called to love. And without love, there is nothing. We are nothing. And you know what? I think, I think that God wants us to remember that today. He wants to remind us that that is still true today. That, uh, that we too allow things to creep in and, and create competition and conflict, and that's not love. And without love, there is nothing. We are nothing. And over the next few weeks, we're going to talk about how we can love without words and love without fear and love without limits. But the first step in all of that is understanding and knowing love and being about love. Because God wants to do amazing things in us and through us, but without love, those things are going to pass us right by. Without love, we are no different than the things and the people of the world. Without love, we're just making a bunch of noise. Without love, it's all nothing. So to bring this home for us just a little bit, I want you to ask yourself a few questions. First, ask yourself this, what am I doing without love? Second, who am I trying to love without love? And third, where am I going without love? So if we use Paul's words here, uh, we know this of love. Love is patient, kind, protecting, trusting, hopeful, persevering, rejoicing with the truth. And we know that it is not envious or boastful, proud or rude or self-seeking. It's not easily angered. It's not keeping a record of wrongs. It's not delighting in evil. And so with that in mind, what am I doing without love? In all of the things that I do, in the way that I do my work, in the way that I take care of my resources, in the way that I plan my days, in the way that I speak to people, in the way that I spend time with and depend on God, in the way that I pursue my hobbies, in the way that I celebrate my wins, in the way that I deal with my losses, in all the things I do, what am I doing without love? Now that doesn't mean, what are the things that I'm doing that I don't love doing? That's something different. It means this, are there things that I'm doing that just feel like a weight around my neck. And when I'm doing those things, I can just feel myself getting overcome by anger and envy. That I feel like uh, these things are some way, in some way, they're, they're, they're like below me, like I deserve better. It's just a struggle at every turn. Well, those are the things that I'm doing without love. And the reality is that we all have things that we need to do, and that's not gonna change, and uh, that's just the stuff of life. And I'm not suggesting that we stop doing these things that we're doing without love. What I'm suggesting is that we identify why we are doing these things without love. Because God is love. And we are in him and he is in us. And we are to be people of love. And so our posture, our attitude should always be that of love. Because the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead lives in us and gives us life. And that spirit is a spirit of love. And so everything that we do should be marinated in love. So what am I doing without love? And how do I shift my focus and find the ability to be a person of love? Because without love, 
I'm nothing. Question number two, who am I trying to love without love? So there's this old saying that says, uh, the ones that we love the deepest, those are the, ten, the ones that we tend to hurt the most. And I think that's uh, because we come to take those relationships and those people, we come to take them for granted. And in doing that, all we're really doing is trying to love them without love. It's like love has become an obligation more so than a decision, and nobody wants to be loved out of obligation. And that's just not good for anybody. So who am I trying to love without love? Where is it that I'm finding it hard to be patient and kind and protective and trusting and hopeful? Where do I find myself being proud and boastful and self-seeking and rude? Who am I trying to love without love? And how do I not just recognize this but change this? How do I uh, dig my heart down deeper in the way that I love people? How do I make that a more authentic part of who I am? Because without love... I am nothing. And the third question, where am I going without love? And what I mean by that is this, that in the directions that I find my life heading, in the way that I set my goals, in the way that I determine what I'm going to be about, uh, where I'm going to concentrate my time and put my efforts, where is it that I am doing that or where am I going without love? Where have I let someone else's expectations determine my direction? Where have I allowed busyness to distract me from intention? Where have I just been going through the motions? Where have I just said yes to something or set my feet toward and it just makes me angry and feel hopeless? Where am I going without love? And how do I become more intentional about the direction of my life and more motivated to be about the things of love. Because without love, I'm nothing. And so the answer, of course, is simple, but not easy. <laughs> because the answer lies in Jesus. See, we don't have the power or even the ability to love apart from God. He is the author of love. He is love. And we need his love flowing through us so that we might be people of love. And that's like entry-level understanding, right? Jesus, I'm a mess. Come into my heart. Be with me. Lead me. Uh, make me what you want me to be. We can't really love well apart from God <coughs> because he is the source of love. And who we are at our core really depends on how much we let him live in us and move through us. And when we find ourselves operating without love, that should be a red flag that sends us back to the cross, back to his presence, back to our knees, seeking after him more and more. Because without him, we are nothing. But with him, with him, we can do all things. With him, we can love without words. With him, we can love without fear. With him, we can love without limits. With him, we can be people of love. It is all about him. It all comes from him and not from us. And we are called to respond to him, to seek his face and to know his grace, to open ourselves up to his spirit, living in us, moving through us, changing our perspectives, in increasing our faith that we may more and more die to ourselves and live in him. Because without him, without love, we're wasting our time. We are wasting our lives. Without love, we are nothing. We have nothing. We gain nothing. But with love, we can change the world. With love, we can know the fullness of his presence in us. With love, we can share him with others and see them come to a greater place of victory in their lives as well. So church, may you be willing to ask yourselves these difficult questions. Willing to hold up a mirror and ask God to reveal to you your soul a little bit. That you might become more about 
love. And I can promise you that when you do that, you will experience love in greater ways than you even imagined. See, without love, it's all nothing. But with love, <laughs> we can change the world. Amen? Let's pray. Father God, we thank you and we praise you for this day, for the opportunity that you've given us to come uh, into this fellowship of faith, for the opportunity that you give us to come around your word, to understand your word in different ways, to see your word from a different perspective and, and to uh, um, know more and more how do we make that word come to life and how do we put that word to life. How do we become more about your business? How do we become more about love? God, we thank you that as we are entering into this season of love where love is going to be talked about and all the movies that we're going to see on TV are all about love and, and we thank you that you've given us this perspective even now as we begin this season that we might know the importance of being people of love and we might know the damage that, that happens when we do things without love. God, I pray that you would just um, speak to each and every person who's listening to this message today, that you would give them the courage that they need to, to ask these questions, to spend some time with you and to allow you to just open up these, these things, that we, might be, uh, that we might be able to admit uh, things that we're, that we're doing or thinking or being that are not of you and that we might be able to surrender those things to you and ask you to, to help us to become the people that you've intended us to be. God, help us be people of love. Help us to be known by our love. Help us to love without exception. That's what you've called us to. I pray that you would empower us more and more to do that. God, we just, we just thank you and we praise you for all that you are and for all that you do. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, I don't know... Well, the Lord is speaking to you today through this message, but your invitation is to identify what next steps he might be calling you to take. So maybe that's a conversation, maybe that's information, maybe that's um, something that he's kind of been tugging at your heart for a while, and today's the day that you say yes to what he's prompting you to do. We'd invite you to connect with us if we can be of assistance to you in any way. We'd be honored to walk with you, to stand with you, to pray with you, to do life with you as you take this next step in your faith journey. Reach out to us.